You are listening to the Techie Leadership Show with Bogdan and Andrei. Hello and welcome to the Techie Leadership Show. Today with me I have Rourke Denver. He ran every phase of training for the U.S. Navy SEALs, holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree from Syracuse University, where he was an All-American lacrosse player and captain of the varsity lacrosse team. He earned a master's degree in global business leadership from the University of San Diego. He also led special forces missions in the Middle East, uh, Africa, Latin America, and other international hotspots. Oh, sounds really dangerous. Uh, author of Worth Dying For and the New York Times bestseller Damn Few, mentor on Fox's competition series American Greed. He also starred in the movie uh, Act of Valor. Uh, founder of Evon Onward, the brand designed to use, to use Navy SEAL principles to call leaders to take actions, to suffer, and to be bold so they can perform at their highest levels. And Rourke uses lessons from trainings with the Navy SEALs to teach leadership and motivate teams to perform at their highest levels. Hi, Rourke, and welcome Hi. to the show. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I am really excited. I'm really curious about what's the take of leadership from the Navy SEALs perspective and how it, does it apply in uh, the modern car- corporate world? And what can we take, especially when we we want to apply those principles in uh, a more techy setting, let's say. Sure, sure. <laughs> and do you want to add anything else about yourself, Rourke? No, no, it's great. I, I appreciate the intros plenty and uh, let's get into it. <laughs> Well, you're the first movie star I have. I'm having on the show, so it's first, awesome. I would say first I've been in a movie. Star, star would be a stretch. <laughs> okay. So, do you want to start with the leadership success story or the leadership failure story? What would you recommend? What would be the yeah, best no, path to take? Well, why don't we do failure and then we'll do then we'll do success so we can kind of build into a good place. So we'll we'll, we'll start with failure. You know, the the, the failure okay. uh, I see the most when it comes to leaders is is leaders that have clearly made the decision that their leadership is about them and and not about the folks they lead. You, you know, the best leader. And when we get to that, I'll tell more of a story that goes with the kind of the success um, story, but. You know, I had two leaders very early in my naval career, basically the first commanding officer, who's the person that kind of runs a command, basically the CEO, if if you will, for a company that runs a command, um, is hands down the finest leader I've ever worked for in my career. And I worked for him multiple times. The second commanding officer I had, because they're changing out every few years, (laughs) was without question the worst leader I have ever worked for. And I worked (laughs) with times throughout my career. So I, I, in, in many ways, it was a real gift at the beginning of my leadership development because I saw very explicit two versions of one, that's who I want to be as a leader, and that is definitely who I don't want to be as a leader. And that second leader was just one of those leaders that uh, it was all about him. It, you know, he had the best ideas. His way was the only way to get something done. If you didn't agree with what he had to say or his concept or what he wanted from you, even if you could have painted out in black and white, whether it was right or wrong, he'd put you in an out group and, 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 you know, kind of shun you and not, um, not treat you well and even work hard to, to almost hurt your career. He was an exceptionally, exceptionally toxic leader. And another thing he did on, on top of making his whole journey and leadership about him is he would kind of get a couple people, you know, Cinco fans, those people that would kind of feed his ego and always be yes, yes men or yes women to him. And then he kept that tight little circle. And if you weren't part of that circle, you were basically out. And if you're part of that circle, I mean, in general, I was pretty happy to be in the out group, but I feel like the people in the in group were just kind of trapped and not really in a real (laughs) kind of organizational um, experience. So he was a very dangerous leader. He created a culture in that team um, that was just toxic, and it and it was really tough. It was really tough. Yeah, um, unfortunately, I had the experience of working for such a, a leader like you're describing in a corporate setting, and he had like, as you explained, like his inner circle, which were basically all people that were sucking up to, up to him, and <laughs> and they were treated really well. They had 
salaries that were beyond their capabilities and all, all of this. But the, you're right. He hurt them because their skill level never increased. They were way behind uh, right. for their compensation. They had like huge mortgages because of their high compensation. There were no way they were leaving that company because yeah. there wasn't any chance in hell that they would get the same level of compensation for their skill set. <laughs> Sure. So, so basically, he created a trap for them. Like, a, I think uh, that's. And I love that you said it, and I don't think I thought about that way. Even though I kind of shared the story, it was. It's like a trap. He put those people into a trap as well that they didn't. I don't think a lot of them even realized they were in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and what did you take like from ex from this experience? Just that that very early on, if I was thinking about my people before myself, if I was thinking about the people I led, um, and there's been a lot of writings about leadership styles and servant leadership, I think is the one that comes to, you know, the forefront of, um, of I, I guess, the basic principles of the concept. But it's just the idea of thinking of those you lead as people you work for them, you work for them, even though you might be in a higher, you know, kind of rank structure, you're there to serve them, you're there to help them and the organization move forward. And if, and if you keep that in your mind, um, there's very few people that, that, that don't want to work for that leader. But when it's the opposite, which it was with that first leader, oh boy, it was tough. It was tough. Yeah. And it's good that uh, you, you got like both experiences, the good and the bad. Yes. <laughs> so yes. you could compare. Yeah. hundred yeah. um, percent. You know, some, some people may, might be lucky and work only for great leaders all the time. Uh, and sometimes some people, and I think most of the people are really unlucky and work like for really bad leaders all the time. Yeah. No, it can be tough. I mean, I think the great, the truly great leaders, I think are few and far between. I think we see that, you know, throughout politics and, and the corporate world and, um, you know, coaches. I mean, you look at professional sports teams and there's, there's two or three people playing at the highest level that those are the coaches that you want coaching your team and you see the results. And the rest are probably doing a decent job all the way down through probably a couple that are doing a terrible job. So the, the truly great leaders are rare. And I'll tell that story next. But, um, you, you know, I think when you one thing I'll offer to kind of your audience also is when you have a bad leader, don't let it, you know, bring you down like an anchor weight. Recognize that you still have an opportunity to learn. I mean, one, you're seeing leadership. If that's a position you end up in, you know, you're not going to be that leader and remember those lessons. And then you know, don't do anything to subvert that leader. I think a lot of people, when they have a horrible leader, they're like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm not going to do my max effort for them. And that only hurts you. You should give your max effort no matter what, because that's going to still move you forward through the process, through the experience and improve yourself, as you said, um, even if, uh, even if you're working under tough conditions. Yeah. And that's really good advice. And thinking about my career is like, even if I had like, not as great leadership sometimes. I always try to work on myself, improve myself, uh, learn from uh, from the mistakes I've, I've saw in others, yes. even if they weren't learning from their own mistakes. And the more you put in yourself, and then when you, if the organization doesn't change, doesn't improve, and you realize you've you've outgrown it, it's time to move on and find some some other opportunity and maybe get a better leader That's you should right. also interview the leader when you're moving on to see if oh, it's good or not for sure for sure for yeah. sure yep. uh, and a good tip would be from my point of view is take a little less money but work with a great leader oh. than to get more money and work with a really toxic one because your health costs more <laughs> I agree. totally agree <laughs> yeah uh, and Rourke, what is the biggest leadership success story you witnessed personally? Yeah, so so the one I witnessed was the other leader I talked about. That first leader I work for um, is an absolute, you know, kind of Navy SEAL commander, captain. He went as far as you can basically go. Absolute legend within our community as a leader, as a man, as a person. And I remember ver very early on when I was at the team, uh, one of our guys, one of the one of the seals in the team, one of the enlisted guys, um, got a drunk driving um, incident. You know, he had a he had a, yes. a, a 
and, and it's bad. And in the Navy, we have pretty low tolerance for, you know, drugs, alcohol incidents, and those type of things. It was actually his second of these, okay? Not with this commanding officer being there, but it was a second. Three, I think you're for sure done on top of probably you're never going to drive again, but he'd had two. So he'd shown a pattern of behavior. He also had some other, you know, rough kind of background, rough incidences with fights at bars. He's just a big, aggressive guy. He's the type of guy you want on the battlefield, but is tougher when you're home. And I remember when he got that, that, that DUI, that driving um, while, while intoxicated, um, the commanding officer will have to hold what's called a formal kind of um, uh, almost, uh, almost like a legal um, um, kind of ceremony with that person to kind of, you know, find out what happened and then either, you know, levy a penalty or, or come up with some type of response. In the Navy, we call that a captain's mast, a captain's okay. mast. So, Almost every captain's mast, actually in my entire career, I've only seen one of these, are what are called a closed captain's mast. So it's the captain, maybe the senior other leaders in the command, and then the, the offending party or the person they're giving the mast to. A commanding officer can decide to hold an open captain mast. That means everybody in the command can watch the proceedings. Not only do you hold an open captain mast, he asked everyone in the team to dress in their finest dress uniform and show up for this captain's mast. Oh. So, the way he sets up this huge conference room is he's got a podium and it's in the middle of this big, big conference room he has. It's very in the middle. There's not a chair in the room. Everybody's going to be standing the entire time. He had the entire command standing behind him. So the entire command of SEALs is standing behind the commanding officer looking at this individual teammate of ours standing there in his dress uniform, kind of absorbing the weight of looking at 200 people staring at him gets into the proceedings, gets in the whole thing. I mean, it probably lasts 45 minutes and all of us are standing there at parade rest. I mean, like, man, this is brutal. Watching him just beat up, you know, a guy we cared for, but it obviously made a mistake. And he gets to the final end. He asks this young man if he has anything to say. The guy is clearly upset, clearly wants to be part of this team and wants to do right. He said, well, before I render my decision, I want to kind of see what the team feels like about this. So he said, so yes. if anybody in the team believes this teammate is worth saving, go stand with him. And there's a little bit of a pause. And then all of a sudden, one of his best friends walks up and stands behind him. And then another couple guys walk and stand behind him. And then all of a sudden, within about five minutes, the entire team is now standing behind this guy who made the mistake, looking at the commanding officer. And so the whole room has shifted in like polarity and intensity. The guy is like falling apart in tears because, you know, he knew his teammates were there for him. And the commanding officer is like, well, there's your answer. If this whole team didn't support you, there'd be no point in me keeping you around. But since the entire team is standing with you, I'll stand with you also. So, you know, he kind of gave him whatever, you know, he, he gave him a, a decision that still stung a little bit because he'd made a mistake. But um, that guy went on to be a top performer. He stayed in the Navy for another 20 years. Uh, I don't think he had another incident again that ever, you know, blemished him or the team. Uh, and it was just one of those masterful moments of leadership that I'll, I'll just never forget this idea of letting the team, letting the organization decide on someone's character, if they're worth saving, not saving. It was just powerful beyond belief. And just the physical way he set up that room with that shift was just one of the most intense things I've ever seen. It was, uh, it was magic. It was magic. Yeah. And that just brings, gave me like an idea. Sometimes as a leader, you have to use a little theater, um, to set a scene to create, to, to help your people. And because if it was just uh, the usual, in a small meeting room, have the conversation, probably that person will not be have had the, the career that he had. But, no doubt. But because he made it so grand and so uh, formal and s with such weight and impression to create mm -hmm. that, it can, you can really change a person's life by what you do as a leader. It did. It did. You got it. And, it, and it, you could see it happen in the moment. It was incredible. Yeah, it was incredible. That's amazing. And I'm really curious because you're talking about servant leadership and it's the army. I had some uh, other people that also served in the army on the podcast and they also told me like servant leadership and uh, you're, it's not like in the movies. You're not barking no. orders and all of this. Does it also apply like in the Navy SEALs? Is it like in the movies carrying logs and everybody drop dead? 
yeah, <laughs> that part's that part's real. <laughs> that part's real. Okay. You know, I'd say the leadership, and even you know, even in the army, there's times for this to happen, right? You know, there's times when you're a brand new person. They shave your head, put you in a terrible pair of pants and boots and shirt just to go all do your workout and try and, you know, kind of almost become part of the team. In that window of time, there's a bunch of barking and yelling and screaming and, you know, making fun of you. But once you've transitioned past, and that's just really to get rid of once to test you to see how you're going to handle, you know, pressure. And then two, it's just to kind of get the individual out of you. It's just to be like, look, this isn't about you. It's about the team. It's about the job. It's about the mission. It's about the country. Um, that's what's important. If you can kind of subjugate yourself and focus that that's what the job is, that your job is to serve, then you've got a real good basic piece of clay after that's done to kind of mold into whatever you need on the battlefield or to do, to do the nation's work. Um, once you then get to the team, it's a lot less like the movies and much more, you know, like a high functioning, you know, corporate or, or business organization. It just has a different mission at the end. Okay. So basically you have like a trial by fire at the beginning. Very much so, very much so, particularly in the elite forces, SEALs, Green Berets, Rangers, those elite forces, the trial by fire is pretty tough. Most people, most people don't see the end, at least in our organization. Ours, we have about a 75 to 80% attrition rate. So only about 20% get through the training just to make it to the team. But they're the top percent, yeah. the best yeah. of the best. And my question would be, my follow-up question would be is, um, have you seen or have you in in the in a corporate setting having a trial by fire like something like this set up when hiring people is it something that will make sense or not or it, it's something I recommend. You know, I do a lot of speaking to kind of corporate entities and I say, you know, you probably don't want a boot camp with logs and boats and people doing push ups and sit ups and <laughs> so wet. But I do think and think having some type of crucible, and it might not just be in the hiring process. It might maybe after the hiring process, doing something um, as a team to really put yourself um, to bind that team to bring. I mean, the one thing that's tough, that's special about those programs is they're so tough that the people that make it really come together. You know, you know, you can count on that person. That person did something exceptionally hard with you. So you're like, I can trust this person. I can count on this this teammate. And so you start your career with just tremendous trust and, and discipline and focus and kind of connective um, experiences that bind you together. So while I wouldn't say, you know, our system is the best for, for corporate America, I would take something out of the budget and go do something hard together, go create some challenge, go come up with something, you know, team building wise, that's better than just the average offering, because I think it just connects people in a way that might be out of the office, that's going to make them better in the office. Uh, uh, one thing that I'm thinking about is it's easier to do this if you hire like a whole department together and they're all new. How how would you work it when, for example, in the Navy SEALs, if you have like a new member joining a, a team to integrate him inside the team because you have already those guys that have been together for years and for boot camps and all this, yep. and then you have a new outsider coming inside the team. Well, that, that's what's happening all the time. I mean, we're constantly getting new teammates that come in from the basic course. Guys are retiring out of the teams and somebody's coming in to fill their shoes. So that's a constant system of, of kind of replenishing the team. It's something we do really well in the military because – Every organization is like this. You know, people only spend a couple years there, move on to another job. They promote into other positions. That's probably going to take them away from the team. So there's this constant turnover at a team. And I think, I think we do exactly what I just described. Everybody knows what the new person went through in the basic course. So even though they didn't do that with them, they know they can trust them because that's somebody that made it through that crucible to get there. And then we just keep testing it and we keep playing with it the whole time. I mean, you're constantly training, whether it's jumping out of planes or learning to blow things up or shoot or physical, just even morning workouts. I mean, one thing we do at the team that I, I don't think most corporate entities do, I think, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the, the uh, Japanese took this very seriously for many years. I don't know if they still do, but they would do exercises together in the morning. And I, and I, and I, uh, I think Eastern Bloc countries did the same thing. <laughs> I think 
super, super powerful that you kind of get your heart going and you spend time together, you know, get yourself primed for the day. And those, those exercises at the SEAL team every morning, they're big. You know, we do it together. You get to make fun of each other. You get to like compete with each other in a healthy way and then go set to the task of getting the day's work done. So I think all that stuff naturally happens at a team. Yeah. And the, the thing that I got that um, sparked like an idea for me is that we said like when a person comes inside the team, you know, he had the same training and that he's a professional. And that's yeah. something that uh, when I'm thinking in any team, any any place, like even in corporate, in tech companies, especially in tech companies, when you're joining a new team, uh, they're going to test your knowledge to see what what their level is. Uh, and if they see that you're a professional, you're going to integrate really easily. If your level is way below theirs, uh, you're going to have a hard time. No also, doubt. the also the converse, the other situation can happen. You realize that your skill level, your professionalism is better than the team that you're joining, and you're you're not really <laughs> happy about it. So it happens both ways. And that's something that is due to the fact that there's not like a standard bootcamp that you can do yes. or event. So you know that everybody had the same experience. You just have to work on yourself all the time and improve yes. yourself. Yep, 100%. And work based on all your life experiences, what would you say is your leadership philosophy? Uh, I mean, I think we've talked about it. I, mean, I don't think we need to go too deep into it. I think it really kind of is that servant kind of style of leading. I recognize very quickly that, you know, the higher I promoted, the higher I went up, kind of, we call it like the flagpole, the more people I could serve that, that even though, you know, by the description, since I'm in charge, they work for me. I always try to very much switch my mind and say, I work for all of you. My job is to serve you and to give you what you need to, to excel. Even if you're coming to my office asking me for permission, the funding line, yes or no on a different program or what we're going to do, um, that I really was in that that job to serve those that, that uh, I was leading. And, it, and it's about that simple. I mean, if you have that as your compass bearing, that you realize I work for the people that by the letter work for me, you're going to do great as a leader. You'll make plenty of mistakes, but on a, on a basic level, you're going to have the right mindset to go do that well. And if it's the opposite, if you think everybody, as you get more out in that C-suite or you you know higher up into the company's chain of command, that now everybody below you works for you, you'll have a toxic feel there. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. For sure. And um, since you're like serving them, you're also really polite, I guess. Yeah, no, I try and treat people well. I was never much of a, I was never much of a yeller or a screamer. It's not my personality, both, um, you know, in, in, in the military and even out of the military is not who I am. I actually think, you know, whispering and saying something softly to somebody, it can be a lot scarier than, than yelling at them. So uh, I try and keep it even and, but I'd hold people accountable. I mean, the, the other thing about being a servant leader, I, I don't say that saying it means you satisfy everyone, you give people exactly what they want. You still need to hold the line. You need to drive the vision. And, and I fired plenty of people in my career as well, which, uh, um, which is no fun, but that's, that's probably the easiest thing you can do. Hiring's hard. Firing's easy. I don't mean in the experience, but it's like you hire, <laughs> when you hire someone, it's somewhat a guess when they've performed terribly. That's not a guess anymore. It's time for them to go or, you know, you get a chance, but it's time for them to go. So, I think people wrestle with that. and I never understood it. It's like, look, hiring, I'm hoping it works out. Now that you've performed terribly, this is no problem. It's time for you to go work somewhere else. Well, that's that's a different... I think like most people have... Um, they empathize a lot with the person that uh, is getting fired, but they don't empathize like completely from my point of view is clearly it's not a good fit for that person. He's, yeah. If he's not performing, he's not fulfilled in the work he's doing and he's there for eight hours uh, yeah. the best thing you could do for that person is if you're serving him is to let him go even if yeah. it hurts you it hurts a little the organization uh in in the short term it hurts also him but by by saying like hey you might you go find a job that really helps you and sparks yeah. passion in you you get the chance to try again and get, get a better person for your organization. Yeah. And hopefully you're going to get the person that you can inspire and 
you can become a leader also. No, that's right. And 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 look, the last thing I want to do is fire someone. I want people to succeed. So oh, yeah. this is not, you know, I haven't done this. Well, I've done it many times just because I had a long career doing it, but but you know, far less than the successful teammates I was able to lead and spend time with. But I've just found that I agree with you totally. When somebody's not performing, um, it's almost always better for both parties to, to go their separate ways. And, and yeah, exactly. If there's an opportunity for a return because there's been growth, awesome. If there's not, I think both parties will land in a better place uh, when someone isn't meeting the standard or exceeding the standard. Yep. Yeah. And sometimes uh, nobody like hires people because they want to fire them and nobody takes a job because they want to leave it or do it really shitty. Uh, the the thing is that sometimes it just doesn't work out, and yes. I find like most managers avoid having the tough conversation with that person. Sometimes, if you have like a discussion, like uh, like you had with that colleague of yours, the re- maybe you can straighten them out and yeah. they, they become. But if you've done everything, yeah, what can you do? Hundred um, percent. And it, it's it, and also some some most managers, it's really hard to hire people. It, yeah. The process in just it's thinking not, about it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's hard. It's it's a it's a real art form and and not something I've actually had to do a lot because our program takes care of it. We have this massive interview selection course that gets really good performers to the front door. So we kind of have our own control measure very early on. So there's certainly, you know, guys that show up at the team that don't perform the highest level. Usually even our lowest level performer is a pretty high performer. So it's uh, it's a good deal as a leader to get that much talent coming to you over and over and over again. That's amazing. And for, um, new leaders, aspiring leaders, what would be your top three leadership tips you would have for them? Yeah, I'd say, um, I'd say for new leaders in particular, trust yourself. I mean, everyone from every position, I think on planet earth, from the most junior position at, I don't know, let's call it a land, you know, landscaping, digging ditches or, or a McDonald's <laughs> all the way up through the CEO of, of, uh, the most impactful business or political position on earth. Every leader that gets in that job is probably just as fragile as you are wondering if they can do it right and hoping they do it right. I mean, I just think people pretend they're more confident they are, they're more capable than they are. And, and people that have got that down often will perform at a high level because they have that mm-hmm. confidence. It's just to trust yourself and it's to try, it's to you know recognize you're gonna make mistakes, own those mistakes, even be willing to share those mistakes and then move on. Um, if you have tremendous successes, give that credit over to your troops, your people, give them the success for the, uh, the, um, or the credit for successes, take the blame for the failures. That's the job you get paid for when you're a leader and, yes. um, just be willing to take risks. I think taking risks is what it's all about. I mean, you want it to be calculated, well thought out and kind of take your time. So you're not just, you know, shooting from the hip. But be willing to make a call. Your job is to make a call. Your job is to make a decision, set the vision, and move that organization forward. you got to be willing to do that. If you just sit back in your office um, playing defense or scared, you're not going to do much for that organization. Yes. And I I like the idea that you're paid to take the blame (laughs) for for all the feelings. And and that's true. when that's your role, that's why you get more money because you have to be able to have the moral fortitude and the character to take all the bad stuff and say, it's my fault. It's because of me. If I need to follow my sword, I'm going to follow my swords. Yes. That's it. If not, if any, anything good happens, it's all about the team. That's right. That's right. Now you get it. And that's why it's hard to be a leader. It's really hard because... Hard. You it's take hard. none of the praise, but you take all of the blame. It's hard. I mean, you know, you got to be careful if you want to go down the leadership path. And I, I recommend it. It's the best place. It's the only place I want to be, but it is not easy. <laughs> yeah. And you, you, you get to grow personally a lot. But it's do. not a... It's not always a pleasant situation <laughs> where you are at. You get, the, you get the real benefit of when you do lead somebody and you see something either special come out of them or you see your team perform at a high level. If you have the right ego and the ability to be like, take real pleasure in that, even if you don't get the big accolades, um, it's so rewarding. I mean, it's just so rewarding when that's the case. And, and the best teams I've led, and I think the teams I've led the best, 
I'd get a nod or a thank you or something or a pat on the back from one of my one of my guys, and that's that's worth more than any you know big prestigious award or or accolades I could get um, for any individual act. When I know my team counts on me, believes in me, trusts me, um, knows I'm looking out for them, that feeds me enough uh, to do that job for sure. Yes, and it, it's something. It's a journey. I don't think it's ever over. Like with all your experience no. and, and you're steeped in leadership, especially coming from your background in the Navy SEALs, do you feel like you've reached like the pinnacle of your leadership? <laughs> or is it over constantly working on improving it? Always moving forward. Always moving forward. I'm not much of a look back person. I mean, I like reflecting on the things I've learned. I like pulling from my past and from history. I love love history, world history, military history, political history. These things are lessons you can pull from. And if you're a leader, you should study that. You should study other leaders. You should study world events. You should study history because it's unlikely you're going to see something that hasn't been seen before. So you might as well at least take some of those lessons and, and apply it to your kind of path. Um, but no, I, I, I think, um, I hope I have more leadership in front of me than I do behind me. And, and, uh, I constantly seek it out. So no, it's, uh, it's, it feels like it's still just the beginning of this journey, even though I've had a chance to execute a lot of leadership experiences and learn a lot. I got plenty more in front of me. Uh, and since we're constant, st constantly studying and working ourselves, what is the book that had the most profound impact on you? Uh, you know, I'm a voracious reader, so it's impossible to pick one almost, but I would say the one that certainly changed the trajectory of my life the most was uh, an autobiography written by Winston Churchill called My Early Life. So the great British statesman, you know, who led uh, uh, Great Britain and the Allied forces basically through World War II, um, wrote a book much later in his life called My Early Life. And it just talks about his childhood up through military academy and, and uh, some skirmishes in the Indian provinces, the, the Boer Wars in Africa, about the time he entered parliament. Um, that's the book that lit the spark for me to serve. So something about that book, the idea of military service and kind of cutting my teeth as a leader, um, that's the book that lit that spark. So I could, I could name 20 more, but that's, that's the one. And it, it's beautifully written. He has a command of the English language, the like of which um, I've almost never read. And so it's, uh, it's a special book for me. And that's why you decided, because of that book, you decided to join the Navy? I did. I did. Wow. It must be a, a really powerful book. It was for me. It was for me. <laughs> That's really good. And Rourke, um, if people want to find out more about you, where should they go? Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Go to um, uh, RourkeDenver.com. So just my name, Rourke Denver, my, my full name, .com. That brings you um, to my Ever Onward site. And I've got a bunch of contest, uh, content. Uh, content. I have all the, you know, this podcast amongst all the other I've done are there. Um, a lot of leadership principles, a lot of teamwork principles. And if they want to kind of have a constant connection on my site, you can sign up for what I call my commander's coffee. It's free to sign up for. You sign up for it, put your name on the distro list. And I basically send out um, right now just one video a month. I don't want to you know, beat you up with every Tuesday emails or things like that. I just send out one video a month on a leadership principle, a human performance principle, a culture principle, something like that. I keep them short. I have fun with them. Um, so yeah, my, my commander's coffee is a good place to find me. I'm on, you know, Twitter and Instagram and that stuff, but I, I enjoy the stuff that I, I, I pump out of my site the most. That's great. And I'm going to put links to your uh, website and some of your social media profiles on uh, on in the show notes so people can more easily connect with you thank it's you. been a pleasure having you on the show Rob. likewise thank thanks so much, much. For the conversation thank you that was today's episode tune in daily rate like subscribe and share please oh you can find further info and materials in the show notes on techyleadership.com including links to the guest book recommendations